All right. Hello, everybody. I'm John Thane with the TV Quarterly Clip Contest, and I'm here today with uh, Matt Pearl from WXIA. He's our 2013 Solo Video Journalist of the Year. Hey, Matt. How are you? Good, John. How are you? Good. Good. Thanks for, for joining us and talking to us about your stories. Uh, you, uh, How long have you been a one-man band? I've been a one-man band my whole career. Um which has now spanned more than a decade. And when I started, actually, I was a one-man sports department. Uh, I was a sports guy, and I was part of a two-man sports department that was quickly downsized to one. So uh, for about a year in Sioux City, Iowa, I spent uh, every weekday shooting, writing, editing, producing, and anchoring two shows a night. So that was a, it was a real one-man band boot camp. And uh, I've been doing it ever since, although now I do it uh, strictly on the news side, and more of a, what I think would be a more traditional one-man band role, um, you know, going out and putting together a story or two every day and getting to work on some long-form pieces as well. Yeah. I mean, I see a lot of, you know, job postings all over the nation. A lot of employers are looking for one-man bands, people like yourself who can kind of do it all. Uh, do you find that it's, having that skill set then has, has helped you a lot as you in your career as you've gone through? Yeah, I think it has been... Uh, just immensely helpful for me. I know, I think in this industry these days, having multiple skills and diversifying your skill set is almost critical when you're starting out because especially if you don't necessarily know what you ultimately want to do in this business, I just think it pays off to know how to do as many things as you can and to experience as many things as you can. And that's not just for one-man bands. I think, you know, if you're a reporter and you're offered the chance to anchor in a small market, I think you should jump at it, even if it's not what you ultimately want to do, because it's the kind of thing that at least you'll get that experience. And you might decide that you like it and you do want to make that a part of your career. So knowing how to shoot, knowing how to edit, that makes you valuable to your newsroom, but it also expands the number of options for you as you move forward early on in your career. And it definitely did for me, again, starting on the sports side, but then knowing how to do it all made me very valuable for future employers. and when I decided to move over to the news side, it wasn't such a strange transition because I knew how to do so much of what I already needed to do for that job. Yeah, what do you think your, your foundation is? If, I mean, are you, would you consider yourself more of a writer or more of a photographer, or how do you balance those skills out? Because they're almost like two different parts of the brain, your writing side and your creative shooting side. Uh, you know, some people have a hard time kind of molding those together. Uh, I definitely have a hard time molding those together even now. I, I think it's uh, it's a very underrated uh, and often underappreciated job that uh, MMJs have is that simply it is, like you say, two, in some cases, cooperative skill sets, but oftentimes competing skill sets. So I think my foundation definitely began more on the writing side and the reporting side and... Uh, wanting to contribute that to a newscast or a news story. But I think as time has gone on, I've really, really grown to love and enjoy uh, the shooting and editing part of it, things that would be uh, the jobs of a traditional photographer. And I think that's something that a lot of MMJs at the start, those who want to ultimately be on camera and be reporters, they kind of look at the photography and editing side as more of a, a means to an end, that you know, maybe I'll just learn how to do it just well enough to put some packages together, and then when I get to, uh, you know, a bigger market, I won't have to do it. And for a lot of people, myself included, when you take seriously the photography and the editing parts of it, which are, you know, so critical, as critical in most cases as the writing and reporting, uh, it really does make you... And I think knowing how to be a good shooter and good editor and wanting to not stop at just being good, but excel at those jobs, uh, has made me much more uh, just viable for people that are looking for jobs to fill. Yeah, and, and so wh where do you go to, to pick up those skills as far as the craft and the, the camera craft? Uh, did you have good teachers, good mentors? How, how, do you, how did you build those skill set? Because that wasn't necessarily your background uh, when you came into this job, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I learned very quickly how to shoot for sports, but that's uh, often a very different thing than shooting for news and shooting a traditional news story. I'll tell you this much, though. I have really benefited from two things. One has been studying those directly around me, 
Uh, I've had the benefit of working in two shops, WGRZ in Buffalo and WXIA now in Atlanta, that are just stocked with tremendously talented photographers. And I have always appreciated that and always bugged as many photographers as I could for tips and, and for just advice. And, and I, still, I still do that today. And I just think that's so important. When you get to a station and you have the people at your disposal who have learned and have so many years of experience, it's so important to try to be as much of a sponge as you can. And then the other thing that I think has really benefit, benefited me, frankly, has been getting involved with NPPA, uh, joining the Storytellers page on Facebook, and just really being able to learn from other people's examples. My first job was in Sioux City, Iowa, and it was at the beginning stages of social media. Facebook was not really even a thing yet, and certainly Twitter wasn't a thing. So the availability of high-quality video work online was very small. Uh, in the past, you know, five, eight years, that's really changed. And I'd like to think I've taken advantage of that. And I recommend any young journalist, reporter, photographer, no matter what the job, find work that inspires you and allow that to be your guide as well. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to talk uh, real quick about one story that you did uh, called Makes You Humble. Uh, it, uh, it placed in uh, General News uh, last year, um, but it almost could have been considered a spot news scene. It looks like you're pulled up to uh, a pretty dramatic uh, devastation uh, from a tornado. Uh, t tell me a little bit about how, how that story came about, and uh, to me, what made it special was the characters that you found. Yeah, I, I think that's uh, still seeing the hand of God, right? from the first quarter yeah, yeah. last year? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, Seeing the Hand of God. Yeah, that's the one I want to talk about. Yeah. Um, and that one, right, that was uh, the day after a massive tornado had blown through this small town in North Georgia. And um, I was basically sent up there with an open-ended assignment, basically go up there and find the story, find whatever's going on, find a, a human story to tell. And I got up there, and it was very challenging, especially as an MMJ, because the officials and the police had blocked off the main area that had been hit by the tornado. So anywhere you wanted to go that was, uh, you know, uh, a location where you'd want to tell a story uh, with the most severe damage, that was about a half-mile walk from wherever you could park your car. So as an MMJ uh, in particular, this made it somewhat challenging because I had to carry all my gear and be able to be mobile and also find a place to edit my work. I typically can't edit in my truck. There's no uh, power source that functions with my computer. So uh, it was a real great lesson for me, not just in storytelling, but also just making the most of what you have. I knew exactly how much time uh, that I could spend in that story. I knew I had about two hours parking my car to getting back to the car, and I tried to use that as wisely as I could. Thankfully, I was able to find the story of a pastor who his house hadn't been hit that hard, but everywhere around him had, and he and his family were struggling as well, but in him I found someone who was as dedicated to making sure the community survived the tornado as his family and his home survived it. So it was really, really powerful, and I just spent my time really working with that and doing as much as I could in as little time as I could. And then I got back and I knew again how much time I would need to complete the story in time to then send it back and, and get it to our live truck so that they could send it back to the station. So, you know, one piece of advice I've always heard from photographers who know their craft is to back time your day. And it involves really understanding your own skill set, knowing how long it takes you to shoot a story, to log a story, to log 10 minutes worth of tape versus 20 minutes worth of tape. Um, to write and to edit. And for me, having that knowledge of my own abilities made a big difference when I was out in the field, again, with a really open-ended assignment and not quite knowing the computer and where I was going to find my story. It really made me kind of lock in and work under a pretty rigid schedule, but I think the story came out really well. Yeah, and, and I think the going back to back timing your day, that's probably even more critically important as a one-man band because you're being asked to do so many different jobs and you're the one that has to think about the timing of each one of those. It's more to think about. Yeah, and especially because, you know, there's... The, the, I think the best two-person crews, uh, you know, both people are always active. 
and the reporter is always doing something that can help the photographer. But in a lot of cases, you know, while the reporter is logging and writing, the photographer sometimes has to, you know, really can't do a whole lot of editing until they have that script in front of them, and, and vice versa. You know, the reporter can write a script, turn it out, hand it off, and then there isn't as much for the reporter to do while the photographer is editing the story. In the case of an MMJ, you don't have that passing of the baton. You're handling every responsibility. So, you know, if you want to spend a little more time writing, uh, you know, focusing on your writing, that's fine, but you have to know that it's going to come back to bite you on the editing side and that you're the one who's going to have to deal with that ultimately. Um, so it's a fine art, and, and I think I really try to, uh, again, know my abilities, know what I'm capable of in terms of how quickly I can uh, do each of those roles, but also what I feel is best for the story. If I, I know it's going to be a relatively quick edit, maybe I do have a little more time to focus on the writing and vice versa. Yeah, absolutely. And I know when I've pulled up to uh, big scenes like that, like big tornado scenes, uh, it's it's kind of tempting to just shoot everything, but you really found a good way to zero in on this one particular character. Uh, do you find that that is something that you're looking for on a lot of your stories? I think every case is different. Um, I think in that situation, I knew that I was not going to be the only reporter uh, from my station covering it that day. So that burden of, of having to tell the whole story and to get uh, every bit of the news of the day as well was somewhat lifted from me. And that enabled me to go and, and find that human story. But there are other times where I don't have that option and it really is, you know, I can't focus as much on getting every shot as perfectly as I would like or spending as much time just on the shooting period. Uh, I've got to focus on, you know, research and making calls and setting up interviews as much as I am doing them. So I think it really does depend on the story. And, you know, I'm a big fan of, of finding the storytelling and finding the human emotion regardless of what the piece is. So I'm always going to gravitate to that. But, uh, you know, especially with harder news stories too, you, you have to remember that no matter how much you want to weave a beautiful story and, and a great narrative, you have to have the substance in there too, have the facts and talk to as many people as you can so that you know the story inside and out before you tell the story. Yeah, great. Uh, Matt, thank you so much. Uh, it was great to talk to you and, and hear from every, you know wh how you tell these stories, and uh, good luck in the contest this year coming up. Thanks so much, John. Thanks for all you do. Thank you.